All right. Well, that takes us to lesson four. Um, I really hope that you're that you're learning something that this is challenging you in a new area. Um, but I did want to I did want to kind of start off with a little bit of a clarification on last on last uh, lesson. Um, I was talking about um, the eternal generation of the sun, and um, you know I I I I don't mean to make it sound like doctrine doesn't matter. Doctrine matters a lot, and doctrine, in large part, is what separates the true church from the cult. Um, and, and you know, Paul write, writes Timothy saying about how to keep a close watch on the doctrine because it'll preserve the hearers, it'll, it'll keep them in the faith. Um, so, I mean, I don't want to play light of it, but what I do want to point out is that some doctrines, do, all doctrine matters, but some doctrines lead to death, and some don't. Okay, so like let's say for instance you say that Jesus is not God. That's a doctrine that leads to death. But let's say for instance you you have a different understanding on who on Jesus's title before he was the Son. Well, that's not something that's going to um, lead to death because the person who believes in eternal generation, the person who doesn't believe in eternal generation. They both believe that Jesus Christ is God. They both believe that Jesus died for our sins and that he is the only way to heaven. See, I mean, uh, in essence, all that, the, all that that debate covers is whether or not the Father has always had the name Father as his character, not just as a relatable title. See, and, and that's, that's really the only, the only change there. So... I, I guess what I'm really getting at is here is it's good to learn theology. It's good to learn doctrine. But make sure that you don't argue about doctrine that doesn't lead to death. Make sure that you only argue over the doctrine that could potentially, um, well, could lead to death. Um, so uh, that takes us to, to the lesson four, which is on finances. We've got a guy in our church who just absolutely loves uh, finances. Um, so okay, let's talk about what the tithe is. I, I know in recent years the tithe has become very confusing for people. Um, you know, some people, well, I don't think that I should have to pay to be part of the church. Well, you don't have to pay to be part of the church. Um, and some people treat the tithe like it's a piggy bank. They give to the church so that way when they're in need or when they need money or when they need this or that, well, they can withdraw some money. Um, other people think that, um, you know, the tithe is unnecessary nowadays. Um, some people think, you know, the tithe is this and that. But I, I want to kind of give a little bit of, of, of clarity to that. So what is the tithe? First off, the tithe is 10% of the income. Okay. That's what a tithe means. It means 10%. So if you're defining tithe as, you know, oh, I'll give a 15% or I'll give a 5%, well, that's not giving a 5% tithe because tithe, by definition, is 10%. So there's that. Um, it's taken before the taxes because it says to give from the first fruits, from the first of, of the grain, from the first of the week, before taxes. So let's say, for instance, you earn $900, but after taxes are taken off, you, you earn, oh, I don't know, $500. <laughs> um, you wouldn't pay the 10% of the $500, you'd pay the 10% of the $900. Um, it's taken off the top. In other words, you pay tithes before you pay anything else. Um, and it's given as a priority. No matter what comes up, no matter what happens, it's a priority in your life. Lord, this is something that I'm dedicating to you. And um, and that is that is something that I'm not going to let situations or 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 bad financial traps get me out of. See, why is it a good thing if you are in credit card debt to withhold from the Lord? It's not a good thing. In fact, in the book of Malachi, he he talks about that. Um, so I, but I, uh, before we go any further with, with um, tithe, I want to look at something. People think that if they pay the tithe, that means that God will give them a uh, financial blessing beyond compare. And I mean, I guess he could, but um, obeying God is rewarded with God's blessings, not necessarily financial. When we obey God, um, 
he blesses us. I mean, we have fullness of spirit. We experience joy. Um, we have we have greater greater direction in life. You know, these are these are blessings that really can't be traded for anything. Um, but for the person who pays tithes expecting a financial blessing, they're giving the tithe with the wrong attitude, and they will more than likely never get that financial um, um, excess that they're looking for. Um, but I will say that oftentimes when somebody stops paying tithes and get because they are in financial difficulty, they usually don't understand the purpose for the tithe, and that's usually why they are in financial difficulty. So should you stop paying tithes if, if you, or should you not pay tithes if you are trying to get out of debt? No. In fact, like I just said, debt is an indicator that you don't understand uh, the proper use of money. So. Um, let me read a few verses here. Malachi 3, 8 through 11 says, Will a man rob God? Yet you are robbing me. But you say, How have we robbed you? In tithes and offerings. You are cursed with a curse, for you are robbing me, the whole nation of you. Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse, so that there may be food in my house. And test me now in this, says the Lord of hosts. If I will not open for you the windows of heaven and pour out for you a blessing until it overflows, then I will rebuke the devourer for you, so that it will not destroy the fruits of the ground, nor will your vine in the field cast its grapes, says the Lord of hosts. So in other words, what he's saying is, when you obey me, I will cause your work to be prosperous. He, he, nowhere in there, though, did he say that I will make you very rich and you will always have financial overflow to the extent that you'll be able to have a $2 million house. He didn't say that. So, uh, James 4, 6. And, you know, throughout the, throughout the Bible, the focus with Christians who have money is not necessarily that money is bad. Okay, It says that money is a root of evil. Okay, the, and Actually, it says, I'm sorry, it's, it says the love of money is a root of evil. Um, it doesn't say that money is the root of evil. And, and so there, there is, should be established there that money is not a bad thing. What's, what becomes bad is when we use it in, a, in an immoral way or when we overlook the hurts of another person. The Bible shows that some Christians did give away all that they had for the well-being of the community. But it also shows that what Christians are expected to do is help those who are in need. Okay, um, if you have the means to bless somebody else, you should. However, if you do not have the means, then it would be unwise for you to. And we'll, we'll talk about that in a second. But basically, the idea is, if you don't have the money to give, you shouldn't give it unless you know. Obviously, the Lord specifically directs you to, um, because it's about. Good money is good money. Practices about discipline, and we'll get to that in a second. So I'm kind of get ahead, getting ahead of myself. But James four six um, says, um, <clears throat> but he gives greater grace. Therefore, it says, God is opposed to the proud, but gives grace to the humble. <sighs> so. Once again, if you aren't obeying the Lord. You will oftentimes find yourself as um, not being blessed of the Lord. So um, it is given to the church to support um, ministers and teach the fear of the Lord. The reason why there is tithes is to uh, to support the ministers. Okay, they they do the work, so they're worthy of of the of being paid. Um, I mean, not only does does Paul write about this, you know, don't muzzle an ox when he's threshing, but also, <clears throat> but also the law teaches us, us this. The, Levi the Levites didn't get an inheritance. They lived off of, you know, certain uh, sacrifices that were given. And, you know, they, they were given certain places to live because they didn't have cities for themselves. They didn't have tribal allotments. Excuse me. And I've kind of talked about that in the Old Testament class. Um, but so it was. It was the it was the congregation's responsibility to provide. Excuse me, the needs for those. <clears throat> excuse me, for those ministers. And in the same way, the tithe is for that nowadays. But also, on top of that, a tithe is also to teach the fear of the Lord. Um, people oftentimes overlook this. Um, you know, oh well, I'll just give offerings to to a, directly to a pastor. 
you don't decide where the tithe goes. The church decides where the tithe goes. You give the tithe to the church. You decide where an offering goes. And we'll talk about an offering in just a second. Um, but uh, Deuteronomy 14, 22 through 23 says, You shall surely tithe all the produce from what you sow, which comes out of the field every year. You shall eat in the presence of the Lord your God at the place where he chooses to establish his name, the tithe of your grain, your new wine, your oil, and the firstborn of your herd and your flock, so that you may learn to fear the Lord your God always. See, it's, it specifically says the reason for it, so that you can learn to fear the Lord. Um, okay, um, and this command uh, was given apart from the law. Um, the command to tithe actually began with um, with Moses. Uh, I'm sorry, not Moses. Um, Abraham, when he tithes to Melchizedek, and that's actually something that uh, the writer of the book of Hebrews plays off of. Um, and then it was established within the law, and then it was reaffirmed by the prophets, and then later it was reaffirmed by Jesus himself. Um, so, um, you know, that's not something that, that we should just write off because we're under the law of grace. That doesn't mean we should... Just because we're, we as Christians are under the law of grace doesn't mean that we should live as lawless. So this command was given apart from the law, and includes more than money. So you shouldn't just tithe of um, you shouldn't just tithe of um, of your money. You should tithe to the Lord of your time and of everything that you own. You you should live your life in, a, in a, as a worship to Him. Remember what I said earlier he, in in another lesson. We don't have all of our different boxes. God's in a box, or finances are in a box, or work is in a box. We have our life and all that it includes, and then God is a part of all of that. Um, and, and so obviously we want to include God in our finances. The exclusion of God is usually the reason why we're in a financial difficulty. So Genesis 14, 18 through 20 uh, talks about um, Abraham giving the offering to Melchizedek. Um, if you want to turn there, I'm, I'm not going to um, I'm not going to read from there. Uh, but it's there in 14, 18 through, 18 through 20. Um, okay, so that takes us to um, to the offering. And, you know, Jesus did affirm the tithe, by the way, um, when he was in his teaching. So the offerings. Um, it, is, it is obviously just like with the tithes, not just with money. God gives you so you, you can give it's about stewardship it's about proper um proper care okay when god gives you something like a car what do you do you take care of it you change the oil you fill it up with gas you know you, you change things when it breaks um you you take care of it because god gave you something a lot of people don't have cars so you if you have a car you are you are tasked that responsibility um, if, if you have money, you know, you can you can be in a position to help those who are less fortunate than you. If you have food, you can give food to people who don't have a meal. See, God gives to us not so that we can hoard it for ourselves and so that we can live life in comfort. The Christian life was never about comfort. Okay? It was always about loving God and loving people. In other words, a whole lot of service. But what we've done is, is sometimes we make Christianity self-centered. We make it all about us. And we make our finances all about us. And as much as you want to believe that you have bad finances because of this or that, you have bad finances the majority of the time because your focus is on yourself. You see something that you want, so you buy it on a credit card. You don't have money to pay off the credit card, so you, so you max out your credit card. You see a new car that you want, so you buy it. Regardless of whether or not you have money, regardless of whether or not you've saved up money, regardless of whether or not you have um, uh-oh money, we'll talk about that in a second. But um, So, uh, it's also something given past the required 10%. The 10% is for tithes. Okay? Anything above that is an offering, and you do decide where this goes. Um, giving financial tithes and offerings is the first step. God, um, that, that's the first step of, of, of moving in the right direction with having not only your finances but your life in a good uh, disciplined manner but we're meant to not stop there we're meant to go from there and then apply to the other areas of our life um, oftentimes we try to separate finances all, as, as though it's something unique from our life but the truth is that finances are not only a big part of life but also are connected with other areas of our life 
See, we have we have principles in us of how we see the value of something and of how we see the value of life and of time. And these same principles we take over into all the areas of our life. So in other words, if I don't have a high value for life and, you know, let's say I, I, I'm very self-serving. I think that, that you know, uh, my wife is there just to serve me. I think that the things in my house are just for me. I think that me, 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 me. And then I have finances. Obviously, my finances are going to be used in the same way that I treat everything else in my life in a self-serving manner. So, um, God expects us to give at least 10% of all we have from time to money. Everything that we have is supposed to be given. Um, and, and you know, people say, oh, well, that's a lot. God doesn't want a part of you. God wants all of you. So in your life, how does that look like? That means he doesn't want you to come to service uh, you know, once or twice a week or give your tithes and that's it. He wants you to communicate with him, to be in, in, in fellowship and relationship with him. He wants you to be in a, in a, in a, in a deeper, deeper walk with him. Um, in Second Corinthians um, nine six through ten, there's a um, there's a offering being taken up for for a group of people, and this is what um, this is what Paul has to say. Now this I say, he who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and he who sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. Now that's a life principle. Regardless of, it doesn't just apply to money, it applies to really all aspects of life. If you don't reap, you aren't going to sow. Did I say that right? I said that backwards, didn't I? If you don't sow, you won't reap. Um, for instance, if when you are young, you make friendships and you serve people around you, when you're older, you're going to have lifelong friends, you're going to have people to pour into, you're going to have people that will pour into you and take care of you. Um, if when you are younger you work hard, you stay at work, you, you, you work overtime, you do your you do your you do your time in the grind of work, when you are older you will have retirement. That's how it works. Life is about, you know, is continually about what you sow, you reap. If a farmer only plants one kernel of corn and that's it. And he, you know it, it comes up, you know, why not? It comes up and, and, it, and it yields him some produce. He's only going to yield from that one that he planted. He's not going to reap an entire field if he only sowed one kernel of corn. So, um, uh, I was reading in 9.6. Um, so then verse 7, each one must do just as he has purposed in his heart, not grudgingly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to make all grace abound to you, so that you always, um, so that always having all. I'm sorry. And God is able to make all grace abound to you, so that always having all sufficiency in everything, you may have abundance for every good deed. See now, notice what he says that you may have abundance for every good need, not just you may have abundance. He scattered abroad, he gave to the poor, his righteousness endures forever. Now he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will supply and multiply your seed for sowing and increase the harvest of your righteousness. In other words, when you step out in faith and serve people, God makes sure uh, God will enable you to continue serving. That's basically what he's saying. God, you may say, well, God will provide for the need. Yes, although sometimes God has already provided for the need, and you are not using what he's provided wisely. And so he has either withdrawn or withheld until you use it right, rightly. And then once you do that, he, um, he blesses you in other areas. Not only that, but when you follow God's principles of finances, you, you will find that you have, you have money. You have what you need. Let me, let me clarify. You have what you need. Um, so, I'm getting a little bit off topic again, though, so I'll, um, I'll go back here. Proverbs 22, 1. If I can find it. Proverbs 22, 1. A good man is to be more desired than great wealth. Favor is better than silver and gold. See what he's saying there? It's not about the money. It's about the use of the money. So, um, the a principle is is God gives us so that we can give to others. 
Um, God gave us salvation. Now go and do likewise. Now go tell other people about salvation. God gives you grace, so be gracious to those around you. God has freed you from a great debt. So if there's other people around you who have wronged you, who owe you stuff, forgive them. Let it go. If we only give the bare minimum, we will we will lose opportunity. In other words, when you when you give more than more than what's expected of you, God just has a way of of bringing by opportunities, of bringing by chances for for you to learn and for you to grow and for you to not only um, I'm not talking about for uh, ways for you to get more money. I'm talking about for ways for you for your witnessing for your testimony to increase. Now I do want to give a little bit of a disclosure statement. Um, oftentimes if you help, I shouldn't say oftentimes, sometimes if you help somebody who is in need, you do more harm than you do good. Now let me kind of clarify what I'm saying. Should we give to the poor? Yes. And should we help those people who are in need? Yes. But sometimes there'll be someone who needs to learn a life discipline. And by you giving them the money, it will prevent them from learning a lesson and it may even make them into your enemy. Because they're going to see you not as a friend anymore, but as a bank. Okay, and I mean that in a number of different ways. First off, they'll know that they'll go to you for money rather than you um, um, – they'll know that – basically, when they need to be financed for something, they're going to go to you. And then if you say no, then that's going to – once again, kind of hurt the witness there. But also, um, let's say – Somebody needs money for, I don't know, a house. Think of something. And so you give them some money, and either you want the money back, or uh, you um, you don't want it back or whatever. And so they do it, and they kind of get this prideful attitude to them. I don't know how this works. It just does. And so then they'll, they'll actually grow to resent you even though you did something good for them. And, and obviously, I could go a little bit more and elaborate more on that, but I think that – I think that – it's best if I just sum it like this. Be wise and discerning on who you give money to. And I'll leave it at that. But it is important to note that Jesus did say, um, to, he, he did teach to give to the poor, and the early church taught that and everything. Um, so, you know, we shouldn't neglect the poor, but we should but definitely practice discretion. Um, there is a middle ground there. So... Um, a slave doing uh, his master's bidding is not worthy of double pay. Some people think, okay, well, I have done this good thing, so that means I deserve a pat on the back. Well, no, you have simply done the bare minimum of what God has asked you to do. Remember, you are a slave to Christ, and you are doing your master's bidding, so why should you be worthy of double pay? See what I mean? Um, if we give for the purpose of blessing, we miss the point, and we also miss the blessing. Um... So that takes us to just some ideas here about financial understanding. Having one mind with Christ in your finances, how to correctly correctly manage your accounts. Let's just say let's just put it like that. So um, um, you credit is a good thing, okay? When used properly. The problem is, is that most Americans don't use credit properly. If you don't believe me, look at the fact of where our nation is in debt. Look at the fact of what the average debt per household is. You've got people who can't afford going to school, taking loans to go to school, and then because the job market is down in the areas that they get a degree in, they can't get a job to pay off their loans. Well... I'm not going to say college is a bad thing. College is a bad thing if you can't afford it. Um, you could become um, an apprentice and a journeyman in something rather than going to college for a degree. Um, you should really analyze what it is you want to do and whether a college degree is actually going to help you. In some areas nowadays, a, a bachelor's won't even help you anyways. You need at least a master's if not a doctorate. For instance, if you want to be a teacher, they're probably not even going to look at you with a bachelor's. Probably. 
Um, but with the masters, well, they're more like with the doctorate. Well, okay, now let's talk. But then here, here's the real kicker: if you have too many degrees, they'll actually pass you over because of overqualification. So once again, you want to kind of do the legwork here and make sure that you're actually not just throwing your money away. Um, but anyways, coming back to that, my point being about credit. Credit can be a good thing, but it's used wrong in America, so it is becoming a bad thing. So. Credit, in simplified version, is hypothetical money someone temporarily allows you to borrow. Now, someone who has some a lot to say on this is a guy named Dave Ramsey, if you've never heard of him. Now, I don't agree with everything that he says, but if you are your average middle class white male, you will benefit from it. Um, however, unfortunately, if you're part of the lower class, you're going to find a lot of that stuff doesn't really apply to you. Especially, I mean, the people I live in a small town. The people I deal with are, are, are drug addicts who are, who are trying to get out of drugs, who are trying to be able to afford rent. The stuff from Dave Ramsey is good, but it may need some modification to teach to a poorer um, black or Hispanic audience. Um, but with that being said, Dave Ramsey does have good stuff to say, so I would highly encourage you to check him out. Um, and he actually condones just not even having a credit card, not even using credit at all. Um, I, I don't agree with him. I think that credit is, a, is, a, is can be a good thing. I think that the problem is discipline. See, just because people don't have good discipline doesn't mean that they shouldn't use credit at all. It means that they should learn discipline so that they can use credit for a good way. Um, but remember that credit is, is hypothetical money. Someone temporarily allows you to borrow. You have to pay back on it. It's not free money. It's not like it just appears out of the sky. And as a general rule, only buy something on credit if you can pay it off with your resources. Okay. And uh, what people do is they double spend credit. They spend the credit and then they spend the money that they had to pay off the credit. So in other words, they're, they're spending, let's say they had $200 in the bank. They spend $200 on their credit card and then they also spend that $200 from the bank. They're double spending the money. Does that make sense? So when you're using credit, make sure that you're actually accounting for it as if it is coming straight from your checking account. Okay? Um, and just in case you don't know, um, a checking account is a general account that you open with a bank um, that normally doesn't really have very many benefits at all. Um, a savings account um, is is usually for keeping money in, and savings account usually you are charged if you have too much financial transaction with it. If you pull money out um, too much in a month, if you put too much money in, these things can lead to you getting fined. Um, and, and there's other hidden fees that banks like to like to hide from you. So just if you do decide to open up a bank account, if you've never had one, um, make sure that you, that you ask if there's any fees or, or any other charges. Um, although something that's important to note is that savings accounts do have interest rates. That they, they do they do build your, the money that you have on there. But the problem is is that they they build the money that's in there slower than money becomes less valuable. Let me kind of clarify. Throughout the course of time, money depreciates, which basically means the same amount of money buys less over time. Okay, and what an interest rate does is it basically pays you for keeping money in there. Okay, but the interest rates on savings accounts in banks today are less than the percentage rate that def that um, money becomes less valuable. So in other words, let's say money depreciates at 7%. Let, just throwing a number out there. I don't really know what the depreciation rate is today. But then let's say that your savings account gives you a really good um, uh, interest rate, 0.1%. Obviously, that's not going to do you a whole lot of good. It's good to have a savings account to have uh-oh money. That you, that, so if you have any accidental emergencies, you have somewhere to go to. But don't look to a savings account to build up um, a retirement. Um, and people say, oh, it's okay, I have a CDC. A, um, I think it's called a CDC. I, I think I'm saying that wrong. Um, oh, I can't remember what it's called. Um, I don't think it's called a CDC. Um, 
Well, anyways, it's kind of like a savings account, but you put your money in it. It's see something. I brain fart here. But anyways, it's basically where they sit, where they take your money, and you can't touch it for about I don't know ten or so years. And um, and you know they, they give you a higher interest rate than you than they would for a savings account. The only problem is is that not only can you not touch that money over that period of time, but also the interest rate still isn't high enough to cover for money depre money depreciating. So. Um, regardless of whatever that thing is called that I really am irritated that I can't remember, you're going to have more luck in um, some in investing in something bigger. Um, if you're into if you have enough money to invest, which once again the people who this class was written for are not people who can who really have money to invest. If you do have this extra money to invest, you're going to want to invest in something like. Um, Maybe like a company or something like that. You're gonna to want to invest in something like that. But before I go too much into that, if you're interested in investing money, um, I highly encourage you to take Dave Ramsey's uh, finances class. And if that doesn't answer anything, I highly encourage you to go talk to somebody who, like a business planner or something like that, who will be able to to advise you in where to invest your money in. Um, I'm not really good at that kind of stuff. I, I don't want to advise you on stuff that I'm not good at. So I'm just going to kind of leave it off there and say if you're interested in, in, in investing, make sure you talk to somebody who's actually in the know and then weigh what they have to say. Don't just take it for gospel. Take it and say, okay, so is this true? Is this apply to my situation? But anyways, um, I'm just – this class is more so mostly just um, with you getting your finances right side up and keeping a good eye on your credit. Um, so uh, debt is the result of, of, of credit. It makes you a slave to a creditor. Basically, what that means is if you take out credit for something and you don't pay it back, you are now the slave of whoever you took the credit from, the bank, um, the car company, whatever. And um, so that's – and not paying this is going to result on bad marks on your credit, which basically means that next time you go to take out credit, you're going to be rejected. Next time you want to get into an apartment, they're going to see your credit score and then it's going to look bad on you. Not only that, but as a Christian, you should, you should pay the debts. If you if you did if you did it you should pay for it, um, and you know I am sorry about that tangent I got off on about investing money. Um, I'm trying to oversimplify something that is actually pretty complicated, um, and then I don't know a whole lot about it on top of that. I'm not like a financial guru or anything, um, and so it's hard for me to simplify it. But I will just point you towards. Uh, Dave Ramsey, if you're not if you're new to this kind of stuff, if you're not new to it, then I don't really need to tell you about it, anyways. Um, but I will say this: a credit score is based on how well you handle uh, debt. That is all a credit score really means: is does this pay? Is does this person um, pay on debt, and does this person have debt? So. Um, but anyways, a depreciating items is anything which loses value with time. For instance, let's say you buy a car for, I don't know, $75,000. Um, you know what? Let's go smaller than that. Let's say $50,000. And what's going to happen is they're going to say, okay, so now you own this car for X amount of years. Let's say, um, let's say you have a six-year uh, loan on the car. The car is going to actually depreciate faster than you're paying it off. Okay, let's say you pay off your car in those six years. Well, your fifty thousand dollar car, okay, is now worth about twelve to eighteen thousand dollars. Okay, uh, and it only goes downhill from there. And depending on how well you took care of it, for instance, if you have kids, I wouldn't buy a new car because they're just going to tear up your car. As much as you love your kids, face the facts, they're going to tear up your car. Um, and so I hope you're not planning on reselling, basically, is what I'm saying. Uh, but um, so that car is going to depreciate. Another thing that depreciates is, is money. Money is something that depreciates over time. So you're not going to want to invest too much in things that depreciate. Um, let me kind of give a little bit of a clarification. Uh, when the... Um, it was in... Um, it was after World War One, the Great Depression. When the Great Depression hit, um, money really wasn't that valuable. Things were. 
that make sense? Um, and and so keep in mind that that money money is just a fictional number that gives you um, rights to own certain things. Um, and also remember that in your banking accounts too. Those are just numbers, okay? That that stand for something. The government gives those numbers meaning, so don't go too attached to those numbers. Um, but so watch out for depreciating items that, that, that lose that lose value over time. Um, interest is is money charged for using money you didn't have. Okay, um, obviously in a negative sense, interest can be positive. Like let's say if you're getting paid, like let's say you have a credit card that pays you however much percent off of whatever you pay. So in other words, let me kind of clarify that. You have a credit card with a 12% interest rate. So you buy $1,000. Well, they're going to charge you 12% on that $1,000 if you don't pay it off within however long, a year or whatever. Uh, I'm sorry, not a year, a month. Um, and some credit cards actually charge you for having the credit card itself. So make sure that if you do have a credit card, it's something that they don't charge you for. So then um, if you pay it off, on many cards, you get cash back or you get um, money back for gift certificates or different things like that, um, depending on what you spent your money on and if you paid it off. Um, so obviously that would be that would be a good thing. So a credit card in essence becomes a covet card, um, where we covet something and we buy it. You know, money is good as long as we have the the um, the ability to, you know, um, say no. Just say no. Um, with that, we're going to stop. I know we really didn't get that far along, um, but there's really a lot of stuff to talk about finances, especially this class was written for people who, who, who don't have a handle on their finances. So more to kind of guide you and help you get a, get a, get a, um, a grab on your finances. So um, I hope it was beneficial. Next lesson, we'll talk more about uh, different steps to financial freedom.